Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning to our students online as well. I think the camera should be a little up. All right. Let's begin this time with a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, get into our teaching. And let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time you've given us, Lord. And even as we spend this time in your word, learning about the blood of Jesus Christ, Lord, we pray that you will make this so real in our hearts, Lord, that we will be able to understand and learn, Lord, the power of your blood that still speaks today, God. We apply it in our lives, oh God. We will see victory in our lives, oh God. We thank you. We just pray, Holy Spirit, that you will speak and minister to each one of us these two sessions, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Right, so we have covered section one. What is section one? Sorry? Covenants, section two, okay, section three, okay, so we're getting into section three now. We'll go a little quick in section three because we've done, you know, we've covered a lot of aspects on the blood of Jesus Christ in section one and section two as well. Um, and so what I want to do is I want to complete this entire section in these two uh, classes. Uh, uh, we're not going to go in detail. Right, but if you have questions, you can always ask me, uh, because the next Friday I'll be traveling on missions. I'll be at Kohima, Nagaland, so I won't be here. So I want to complete this uh, section today. Okay, so if I'm fast, it's only because I want to complete it. But if you have questions, ask me. Don't don't stop. Right. Okay. Section three. We're going to talk about the blood of Jesus, and. In the Old Covenant, we saw what is the importance of blood, right? We saw that when God put Adam and Eve in the garden, he made a covenant with them and he sacrificed an animal that was bloodshed. He did that with Adam, he, he did that with Abraham, right? And we saw that covenants were made by blood. Why? Because blood refers to what does blood refer to? If there's no blood in your body, what will happen to you? So blood is life. <laughs> That's what it is, right? So the point of the covenant, a blood covenant, is life for life, right? Uh, and, and then we saw the shedding of blood uh, in, the, in the book of Exodus chapter 12, when God told the people of Israel, you cut a lamb, take the blood, and put it around the doorpost and death will pass by. Again, it was a shadow of what Jesus would do. Then the priest consecrated by the blood and the anointing oil. Now, this is very important. In the old covenant, we see the high priest had very important works. One was he would look after the daily sacrifices. Right? So people will come just like all of us, you know, we would we would go there give a ram or a goat, and we would offer it as a sacrifice. But once a year, remember the Day of Atonement for the entire people of Israel, right? So what would happen? They would first be anointed. Then after anointing with anointing oil, they would offer the sin offering for their own sins. Then they would take a ram and offer it as a burnt offering, right? And the blood of the ram, this is again very important, right? We'll be put on the right ear, right thumb, and right toe. So if you picture this, you're going there, uh, you, the, you give the ram, the ram is cut, the blood is taken. The high priest will take a drop of blood, put it on the right ear, right thumb, and right toe. Why? Your, what you hear should be consecrated of God. What you do should be consecrated of God. And where you go should be consecrated of God. Right? These are all rituals that happened in the old covenant. But they all have a meaning. Right? So even if you, if you go back and look at all the ways, all the burnt offerings, sin offerings, all of them had a meaning. And why did Jesus say, I've not come to abolish the law, but I've come to fulfill the law. There was a meaning. It's a shadow, right? So, for example, there's a light pole, right? And there's a light pole, and you see the shadow. Will you be scared to cross the shadow? 
Why? Because it's just a shadow. But if it's a real light pole, you won't go and bang into it. So, so the old covenant is a shadow of what is going to happen. So what is important, the shadow or the real thing? The real, right? And so that's what Jesus did when he came into this, when he died on the cross. He fulfilled all of this that was there in the Old Testament, right? And there was atonement for sin only by the blood, right? We talked about all of this. If we go to God without a ram or without blood in the Old Covenant, he'll say, that means you're not really asking for forgiveness. You're wasting my time. This blood is what will bring forgiveness of sins. It is through the blood, right, through the, in the Day of Atonement where the high priest takes the blood and pours out. It is only blood. He cannot take juice and go. He cannot take any other liquid. Even if you give the most expensive perfume in the world to the high priest, the high priest will say, go throw it somewhere and get me in the blood of a ram or a goat. Because blood is what speaks. Now the question may be, why blood? God, you know, we can ask God, no, why, why blood out of all the things? Why not something else? Because it is life. Right? Blood is, is something that is, that is there in each one of us and blood brings life, this blood. It is a price to be paid, right? So when in the old covenant, when, when God, when the people would take the ram, they would cut the ram, they would kill the ram, and they would let all the blood flow out. And towards the end, they will take a small portion of blood for the sacrifice. You know, for us, it may sound, oh, why did they do that? It's so bad, it's so gruesome to how can you kill a lamb or a goat or a or a calf how do you why do you want to kill it let them live no it was because the the the, the sin that was on us was put on that so somebody had to pay for life right and now by the blood we have covering of sins we have acceptance of offering covenant that is ratified by God we are, the blood of Jesus speaks even to this day. You know, we, you know, many times we pray, right? What do we pray? I cover him by the blood of Jesus. Or I cover my family with the blood of Jesus. Now, it's not just a good line to pray. Just because I heard somebody else pray, so even I'm praying it. No. What's happening? In the spiritual the Bible says his blood still speaks. So his blood is living. It's alive. Yes or no? Right? It's not, it's not that we are praying, okay, I cover him by the blood of Jesus and then nothing happens. No. The blood of Jesus is working. It's not the blood of rams and goats. Right? So the blood of Jesus, we go to chapter 24, is the sinless, spotless, Lamb of God. Let's read John 1 29. John 1 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Mm. Now, when we read it, it says, Okay, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But picture this in John's time. Right? Now, uh, what I want you to do is think that you are in the Old Testament. Okay? Every time, every maybe three months, you're going and doing a, a, you know, a blood, uh, a sacrifice, a burnt offering for my sins or a sin offering. So you've been doing this every time, every three months. And then you know, okay, once a year, the high priest will take blood and go. So it's a common thing. Now, when it's common that time, here John is saying, behold, He's looking at Jesus and saying, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, the Jews who are listening to it, they know that if they take the blood of the ram or the bull or the blood of the animal, there is covering of sins. They know it. But the same people are listening to John and saying, see, there's a Lamb of God who's going to take away the sins of the whole world. So you, you understand how powerful this sentence is for them? 
So if I was there, you know, as a disciple, who is that lamb? Because I know of those other lambs that I do the sacrifice. But who is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world? Jesus, John the Baptist is pointing to Jesus. Revelation 13, 8, he says, And all who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life, book of life of the, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. From the foundation of the world. You saw the Easter production, right? right? You saw that aspect of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit discussing? So that means what? Before the foundation of the world, before God said, let there be light. So the scripture says, not the Easter production. Scripture, scripture says, before the foundation of the world, Christ crucified. So the question may come up. So that means God knew Adam will sin, no? Tell me what God doesn't know. He knows. He knows all things. This, the cross, the blood, everything was not a plan B. It was not second option. It's option one. The reason God told Moses, you, you do all of this. The reason God told, God did it in the Garden of Eden. You know, when Adam and Eve sinned. And then to Abraham, to Moses, and he told the people, you cut the goat, you cut the lamb, let there be blood. There was a reason for it. What is the reason? One day, there will be a blood that will be the sinless lamb of God. That blood will cover all our sins, will wash away all our sins. So another question may be, why did God have to go through all of this? Once for all, just send Jesus. No, why 4,000 years? No need Old Testament. No need to study Old Testament survey. God is a God who knows what is best. He knows his timings. He knows the way he works. Right? So we cannot question God. Why did he do it this way? In God's eyes, this was perfect. You understand? Right? Now, they may not understand. But now when we look back, we understand. When we look back to the Old Testament, we understand. Everything that God spoke of was already planned, right? By his blood, we have forgiveness of sin. So we talked about this in Hebrews 7, right? So there's no need of any more offerings. No, basic question, just like, uh, um, no, uh, Jesus and the, his blood has saved us and has cleansed us from all our sins. Yes. Now, what about the times in Adam and Eve and uh, thing when they lived in? So that time, you didn't have the blood I'm of. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. What, what are the times when uh, Adam, Eve, and uh, Cain when they lived? Yeah. And so, how would they be saved, or like what could yeah. have happened? Yeah. Them? So, so we talked about this. So, they had to do their offerings, right? So, for, from the old covenant, those who were part of the old covenant, they would partake. So, for example. Always picture yourself like if you're reading the Bible, picture yourself. So now I'm in the old covenant. Okay. But I love God. I want to live a holy life. I follow all the. But this Passover, all these things came in the time of Moses. No? Correct. Like, huh? so yeah, but. Adam? Yeah, so God, God, in the book of Genesis, God killed the animal, right? He made the. Uh, and he gave them skin to wear. So that was the first blood covenant. And I'm sure God would have told. Adam, so now onwards, you do this. When you kill an animal, you take the blood, you offer it. Only thing, during Moses' time, the tabernacle, all of that was established. Right? But Adam, during Adam's time, during like even Abraham, Abraham put, uh, sorry, God put Abraham to a deep sleep and God himself walked through the flesh. There was no temple at that time. Right? So it was this whole thing of tabernacle, Ark of the Covenant came in during Moses' time. Probably they just took the blood and just did a small prayer. That's it. So saving of, uh, sorry, that is like cleansing of sins. Yeah, covering of sins. Co covering of sins. Covering of uh, sins. And how would they be saved? Because New Testament says you will be saved only when you believe in your heart and you say that Jesus is Lord, you're saved. 
so before the times of jesus how would they have been saved yeah so before the time of jesus there was no uh, you know their spirit was the, the salvation now again salvation the hebrew word is a big word but when we talk about it salvation this therefore if anyone is in christ he's a new creation that was not yet experienced by them right so so what happened was they just knew they had a picture they had a shadow of who god is and they when so last class we talked about you know this abraham's bosom and paradise so those who believed in god they lived a righteous life there was a place for them right uh, now see for example daniel and all these great men and women of god they did more than what we did <laughs> And Hebrews 13 talks about it, right? By faith, they did this. They subdued lions. They subdued kingdoms and overthrow. So it was it was not that they needed, you know, at that time, there was there was still sin. But God made a way that through the, through the blood of these animals, he would not look at that sin, right? It was just a covering. So, see, for example, you and I, like, we may sin, right? If Jesus' blood was not, if Jesus did not die on the cross, it was, we would have had to go and do one blood, uh, guilt offering, sin offering. Come back and live a righteous life. Again, if we had sin, again, we have to go and, you know, do it. So it was a repetitive thing because they know that I have to do this to get covering of sins. Now, God is not upset with me. So they kept doing it. If you look at even, you know, the greatest monarchs of the old covenant, they would have kept doing these offerings until their death. <laughs> they would have had to do it. And again, for us, it may sound, oh, how, how long you'll keep doing it? Have to do it. Right? Because they had to do that to please God. And God will not bring punishment on them. Right? And even like First Samuel is, uh, you know, very interesting. God told Saul, Go and defeat the Moabites. And he went and defeated them. But Saul, and he said, God said, don't bring anything back. But Saul looked at all these animals. Well, they were so healthy. He said, oh, we'll bring them and we'll offer them to God. God was so upset. God said, did I ask you to bring it? I don't even want the offering of that land. So you see how particular God was. So when you talk about this whole thing of what we experienced, they never experienced it. Yet they did so much through faith. They just, they just had faith in God. But what we experience, the baptism, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, is something that for them it just came and went. Right? So, so again, Ephesians 4, God, Jesus, after his death, he went, he preached to them. He said, okay, listen, you remember all that you did in the old covenant, the sin offering, burnt offering? It is all about me. I am the son of God. I paid the price. The blood has shed, been shed. And now, you know, there's forgiveness of sins. This great we read, no? He, after uh, he died, he descended to hell. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah, that's what he did. He went, he went into Abraham's bosom and he preached to them. He told them. So this place was a place of rest. So he told them, this is what I've done. The work has been completed. And then he took them to heaven. Out of the box question. I mean, uh, I've heard this before, but I don't have clarity on that. Now, Judas Iscariot, uh, he uh, committed suicide. Yeah. And then you see Jesus dying on the cross and thing. So one hypothetical question is, assuming Judas Iscariot had not committed suicide, and after the crucifixion of Jesus, would Judas have been saved? Yes, one. Definitely. And since he is committed before the thing, so see if if Judas had not committed uh, uh, suicide, Jesus would have said, "Okay, come back." Yes or no? Because see, what what, what wrong did Judas do? He betrayed Jesus. What wrong did Peter do? He denied Jesus. It's it's almost the same. It's not like this is very big. But it was written so that, you know, uh, that Jesus had to be crucified. So, for example, right, if if Judas got, went back and said, God, I made a biggest blunder. And that's what he did. He went and he threw the money back at them. And But it was guilt that was there and said, how can I betray the son of God? I mean, I, I've walked with him for three and a half years. 
But if you had just overcome it, you would have still continued to be the treasurer of the ministry. But again, the psalmist writes and says that, you know, uh, the betrayer uh, with his own money, with 30 pieces of silver. So there was also prophecy that was involved there. Right, so, yeah. Okay. So, brother, yes, brother one more question. Uh, Matthew 26, 39, can you put some more light upon that uh, verse, brother? Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Yeah. So here's the thing. Now, the Lord Jesus was completely man when he came on earth, right? He ate, he, he, could, he, he left his glory in heaven, and he came down as a human being. So now, at the Garden of Gethsemane, it was not the physical pain that he was worried about. Right? It was not about, oh, they're going to crucify me. What if this pains? What if my back pains? No. Now, all through the scriptures, we see that John, in the book of John, what is Jesus saying? The Father is in me and I am in the Father. The Father and I are one. Right? The Father himself says, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. So there was this unity, Trinity, right? What is Trinity? Have you heard the word university? The word university means unity in diversity that's what unit, unit, uh, university means. Unity in diversity in the community of the Trinity. It's already <laughs> confusing. But here's what happened, Lucy. At the Garden of Gethsemane, the thought that Jesus, the Son of God, who was always with the Father, is going to be separated from the Father. Now, that separation was too much. For Jesus to bear. So that's why he there was you know blood because of the stress that he had, there was blood coming from his body. And he said, Father, if there is any other way that I can take up this, help me out. But if there's no other way, let not my will, but let your will be done. It was the separation. You see, Jesus had to become what we are: sinners. Now, Jesus has not tasted sin. As God, he doesn't, he has not tasted sin at all. Right? So that's what happened. When he said, take this cup away from me, let not my will, because he could not take up. It, it was just too much for him to bear. And that is why on the cross is the only place where Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Everywhere else, Jesus says, my father. But here he becomes my God. Why? Because of the separation. So that's what, that was the cup, the cup of wrath, the wrath of God that he had to drink. So, okay, 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 brother, thank you. It was the pain of separation from God at yes. that moment. Yes, yes, okay. yes that thank was you, the... Yes. Okay. Next, he became our mercy seat, which is our complete reconciliation. Romans 3, 23 to 26. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, the Greek word here, when you talk about uh, propitiation, is uh, you see that Greek word, hilasterian, which is an atoning sacrifice, which is a mercy seat. When Jesus died on the cross by the shedding of blood, he, what he did was he showed mercy to the sinners. That even on the cross, Jesus says, forgive them. Right. So right now, what is Jesus doing? He is seated on his mercy seat. That you and I, no matter what sin we make, no matter what sin we do, our sin will be forgiven. 
Is there a sin that will not be forgiven? No, through the blood of Jesus. Is there a sin that the blood of Jesus cannot forgive? No. Because when Jesus says it is finished, the work was finished. Right? And right now, when we go to God, when we go to Jesus, we can ask for his mercy. Yes, Warren, go ahead. Uh, uh, brother, Pastor, does it, does it, doesn't it say that uh, if you uh, sin against the Holy Spirit, you'll never be, not be forgiven? Yeah, so we should get the context. We get the context of that, right? Now, when we look at, okay, uh, when we blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, right? It does, that's a sin that is not forgiven. Now, that is for believers who, you know, so when you look at the context of that scripture, it's talking... Uh, he's talking about a time when I am a believer, right? If I'm a believer and, and we go to God and we go, and I continually, purposely blaspheme against God, then there is no, there's nothing more that I can do. And it's written also in, uh, I forget the passage, but I think it's, I think it's 2 Corinthians when he says, uh, if we continue sinning, there is no more sacrifice that is that is nothing that can be done. Right? So the context warrant about that is if I purposefully keep blaspheming against God, after tasting the goodness of God, after you know experiencing God and the work of the Holy Spirit in my life, and I deny it and I keep blaspheming against God and against the Holy Spirit and against the things of God, it's like what Paul's saying, right? There is no more sacrifice that can be done there's nothing more that can be done if i go on sinning against god purposefully and so that's the context on what he was speaking yes hebrews and if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth no sacrifice for sins is left but there is also i think in, i think it's also a passage in corinthians where he talks a little bit about this uh, yeah, but that's the context. Um, I'm, okay, shall we go ahead? Okay, so he tore the veil and he opened the way. We talked about this as well. When Jesus died on the cross, the veil was torn. It was a picture to show that now it's not like only the high priest can go in, but that separation, that wall was torn. And we can enter the presence of God in boldness. Right? He made Jew and Gentile one. Very important. Jesus was a Jew. Remember that? Right? And when he chose his disciples and he said to his disciples, go and, you know, he made the, send them two by two. And he said, go only to the Jews first. Now the Jews must have felt, okay, this, what... The Messiah is doing is only for the Jews. But when Jesus died on the cross, it was for the entire world, John 3 16, that whosoever believes in him, it doesn't say only the Jews believe in him, whoever believes in him will have everlasting life. Now, this was a problem for the people who are living during Jesus' time. Do you know after how many years approximately that they started? sharing the gospel to the gentiles the pentecost happened acts chapter 2 after that it took them almost 15 years for the first message to be preached to the gentile 15 years why because the jews always felt this message is only for the jews but remember god spoke to peter the lord jesus spoke to peter through a dream and said what I am calling clean, why are you calling unclean? So get up and go. And he goes to Cornelius' house and they pray over Cornelius and the Holy Spirit comes upon them and they all began to pray in tongues. And that was when they realized, hey, God does not differentiate between Jews and Gentiles. So you can be... You know, from any religion, any caste, any creed, any background, it does not matter. 
the cross is a place of invitation. The blood of Jesus has separated or, or has broken down that separation. We can be from any language, any race, any culture, doesn't matter. If we come under the blood of Jesus, we're all one. We're all one. So what about the uh, what about you know the great apostle Paul and Paul Emmanuel? One. They're the same. And when the Lord Jesus, just think about this. When the Lord Jesus looks at us, he looks at us as the same. He doesn't look at us as, oh, you're better than him. Because God is not a God of favoritism. But God is a just God. So there are rewards. The Apostle Paul's reward is much, much greater than Paul Emmanuel's reward. Because he did so much more. But when Jesus looks at us, it's the same. It is only we who make the differentiation. But Jesus says, you're all a one, whether Jew, whether Gentiles. Now, if the case was, you know, you're better because you did more, then we're coming to Jesus by works. Paul did three missionary journeys, so I want to do four missionary journeys, or five. Then we're coming by works. That's not how, it, that's not how God works. Right? God is saying, come to me just the way you are, through the blood of Jesus. Right? Through him, we offer up our spiritual sacrifices. The blood of Jesus, through the blood of Jesus, we are cleansed, we are forgiven, we are reconciled to God. We are released from dead works. We are consecrated. You know what is consecrated means? We are set apart. We are children of God. People will look at us and say, hey, why are you doing this? Why are you, you know, Going to church every Sunday, every time youth meeting, this meeting, because you are consecrated to God. You're separated. We have been justified and made righteous. Now, remember the uh, homework I gave you? What is justified? Sorry? Just is... as if you have not sinned. Yes, thank you, Gertrude. What is righteousness? Ah, very good. Right standing with God. So that means I've done my work in this course. Okay, very good. So we are justified and we are righteous. By the blood of Jesus, we have access to the presence of God. And we offer up our spiritual sacrifices. The Lamb of God is eternally, he will be recognized as the one who will take away our sins. He's done, the price has been paid once for all. What about... 20 years from now, yes. 100 years, yes. 1,000 years, yes. Do you know something interesting in the book of Revelations? I, just a little digression here. When we go to the book of Revelations, there will come a time in the 1,000-year millennium, Jesus will go sit on the, uh, in the temple and the Old Testament sacrifices will be reinstated. You know that? They will start cutting the lamb and all and they look at Jesus. We are doing this because of that. Don't ask me why they are doing it, but that's going to happen. Right? So, it's, so it is to point, everything is pointed to Jesus. Everything. He's the center of everything. Right? The blood of Jesus is the Passover lamb. You see that uh, the blood applied is seen on the, you know, in the book of, uh, in the book of Exodus, where the blood was put on the doorpost and uh, death passed by. Applying the blood to your door, to the door of your house. Revelations 12, 11. And they overcame him, that is the adversary, the devil, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And did they, they did not love their lives to the death. Okay, everyone say this with me. And they overcame the devil by the blood of the lamb. And the word of your testimony. This is a powerful verse that I always keep declaring over myself. The enemy will come. He will bring confusions. He will bring fear. He will bring doubt. He will bring, you know, all kinds of things into your life. That's his work. 
but you have another work to declare God's word. You can say, and I will overcome the devil by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. You just speak the blood. How can you do that? Okay, if you're going on getting temptations in your mind, you say, I cover my mind by the blood of Jesus. It's not like one ring will come around your head. No. What will happen is in the spiritual, if we know the power of the blood, there will be like a wall of protection around us, around our mind. All of a sudden, we are not thinking about the things of the flesh. We are thinking about the things of God. Now, it's not a magic potion. We have to work towards it. But it's by the blood of Jesus. I cover myself with the blood of Jesus. I cover my family in the blood. I cover my home by the blood of Jesus. What are you doing? You're giving no entry to the devil. Now, the devil will come. You know, you can picture it this way. The devil will try to come. Okay, how do I enter this guy's house? Oh, they're, every time they're praying, morning they're praying, afternoon they're praying. Night they are praying. Every time there are Bible verses that are going that is going on in this in their house. Every time they are you know, you know worshiping God. How do I enter this house? So he'll try different ways through the back door. He'll try to bringing confusion, you know, arguments in the house, bringing fear, bringing hatred, all of this. But you say, I am. This house is covered by the blood of Jesus. No devil, no demonic work can enter your home. No demonic work can enter your life because you are covered by the blood of Jesus. The devil knows the power of the blood of Jesus. He knows it very well. Very, very well. Right? So you don't have to explain to him. You just speak it. Speak the blood of Jesus over my life. I speak the blood of Jesus over my children. I speak the blood of Jesus over my family, over my mind, over things that I see, over the things that I hear. I speak the blood. Right? So you got to do it to see the results. The blood of Jesus, chapter 26, is our complete redemption. We talked about redemption, right? The Lord Jesus redeemed us. He bought us with a price. It's not like the Lord Jesus went to the devil and said, okay, devil, let's come up with a solution. Okay? You take 30%, I'll take 70% of the population. Or you take only the Jews, I'll take only the Jews, you take those who are the Gentiles, I will take this, this part of the world, you take this part of the world. That was not what it is. When Jesus died on the cross, he made a complete redemption. So the Bible says he destroyed the devil and he took the keys of death and hell. That means he said, hey, devil, it's not, this is not yours anymore. They all belong to me because I have defeated you. You know, in the play, we, we, we uh, you know, there's a song that we, that I always used to sing many, many years. The song is forever. And there's just the portions of these songs that really is powerful. Then the ground began to shake. The stone was rolled away. And his perfect love could not be overcome. The moment Jesus died on the cross, and when he rose again from the dead, you know, when Jesus died, he said, it is finished. What was finished? He finished. He paid the price. He defeated the devil. Now, because he defeated the devil, he could overcome death. And he, and he rose up from the dead again. What is that? But he paid the price. The entire price of the sin of the world was, he paid it. Now he goes to the devil and said, I paid the price. You brought death in this world. You brought sin in the world. I pay the price. You brought death. I will overcome death. So it was not just a small defeat. It was a greatest defeat for the devil. The greatest victory for the kingdom of God. Greatest. 
So right now, what the enemy is doing is he knows he's defeated. He's trying to bring as many people into his kingdom. That's what he's trying to do. What are the methods? Same methods. Did God really tell you to eat from the fruit? Eat the fruit of the tree of good and evil? Did God really tell you? What, did hap what happened in the garden? God really told you. I don't think so. If you eat, you will become like God. That's why he's saying not to eat. Is it the same thing he's using now? The devil? Same. Did God really tell you? Did Jesus really die on the cross? Did Jesus really take your sins? Look at your sin. Look at what you've done. You are a waste. So instead of all this Jesus business, you do something else. Become, there is no Jesus. There is no God. Same, same method he's using. Deceiving, lying. Oh, how can I believe in God? Pride. I will not believe in God. I did everything on my own, my own strength, my own ability. Same thing. Or did, why was he thrown out of heaven? Right. He thought he'll become like God and take God's place. So it's the same methods, right? Same technique, but he's adding new things to it and bringing it to us. Right? If you take a real note and you put a fake note, both look the same, right? A currency note. A real one and a fake one. You put it next to each other, they look the same. But there's a way to look at the counterfeit. Right? You look at it properly, oh, this is fake. That's what Jesus, that's what the enemy does. He'll take a story and he can either completely make it false or he'll make it in a way that, okay, he can change it here and there. He can add a little poison to it and he can make us drink it. I've read of many books where people have said Jesus died on the cross, but actually he did not die. After the cross, when they brought him down, there's a way that within five hours you can resurrect, you can uh, make the heart breathe, you know, breathe, uh, pump the blood, and you know, the heart can start beating again. That is one story. Another story is. You know, Jesus came and when he was on the cross, God could not take it. The father was very sad. And so he sent somebody else, like an angel who looks just like, and Jesus came down from the cross and he went away. That's a second story. Then another story is, it was not even Jesus on the cross. It was somebody else. By then, when Jesus knew that they're going to you know, take him, he, he fled from there. So they had a replica of Jesus and he took up Jesus' These are the things. And these are stories that people believe. Another story which is there in the Bible is in the book of John, where they still believe that the disciples stole the body of Jesus. Still they believe it. And now look at the Jews. The Jews are saying, we are waiting for the Messiah. The Messiah will come. The Messiah will come. He'll come on the, you know, like a great king. He'll come. They've completely blinded by what has happened in the Old Covenant. Completely blinded. They don't want to believe it. Who's doing that? It's the devil. Imagine all the Jews believe in Jesus as a Messiah. That's it. You know, and still God is blessing them. But it's the same, same techniques. But thanks, thanks be to God. That his Holy Spirit is there. That he has sent the Holy Spirit. That's why the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than the devil who is in the world. So the devil can put a hundred things inside a person. Don't believe in Jesus. But if the Holy Spirit comes and quickens one word from the scripture, those hundred things dissolve like fire, no? like wax that will dissolve. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? So never feel like, I know I'm going a little bit away, but never feel that a person, when you're sharing the gospel to a person, oh, this guy won't believe, or this person won't believe. Never feel that. He may be the worst criminal in the world, but if you're sharing the gospel, 
And if the Holy Spirit touches that person, it's changed forever. The devil cannot come against the Holy Spirit. Remember that. The Holy Spirit is much, much, much more powerful than the devil. The devil can bring diseases and cancers, and the Holy Spirit can just quicken it, can give you new organs in your body. The Holy Spirit is not somebody who has to check, okay, is this something that can be treated? No. He can do it in a second. He can do it. There's nothing impossible for him. So here's, here's what I'm getting to. Never, never look at what the enemy is doing. Don't focus on what he is doing, but focus on what the Holy Spirit can do in a person's life. Right? The blood of Jesus redeems us. He redeemed us from sin's power. Sin has power, but he redeemed us. He redeemed us from Satan's work. He redeemed us from this present evil age. Now we are all living in here and there's a lot of demonic work that's happening around us. Yes or no? Now with all the technology that we see, it's not very difficult to sin. Yes or no? Very easy to sin. It just takes a few minutes. And the world that we see around, it's full of sin. But he delivered us from this present evil age. And things may get worse and worse and worse going forward. The enemy can bring up such you know, evil atrocities in this world. I was reading the news yesterday where this, this man, uh, I think it was in India, Muslim man, he killed his six-year-old daughter because she did not get up for the you know the fasting that happens. Right? Killed her. What is? Why? You think every every will a father do that to the child? This is nothing but the enemy. The enemy does this. Some for us it's too much to understand. For a normal hum, human being, forget Christian. It is too much. That's what the devil does. He blinds us. He blinds our mind, our, our thinking, everything blinds it. But the blood of Jesus has redeemed us from this present evil age. He has redeemed us from the empty way of living, handed down to us. And he has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Why is the law a curse? Because it brought no it brought no forgiveness of sins. The law brought no salvation. The law did not give us a new spirit. But when we became believers, it cleansed us from all sin, made us a new creation. The law couldn't do that. We are redeemed into a higher kingdom. We are redeemed into the right standing with God. We are sons and daughters. We are kings and priests. We are in covenant blessings with God. The blood of... Okay, uh, we'll take a break. We'll come back and we'll complete these three chapters. Yeah.